Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess with that, uh, I'll just get started, and if other people pop in later, uh, no worries. Uh, so yeah, for, first of all, uh, big thank you for uh, inviting me to give this uh, little talk here at our group um, today. I want to tell you about some recent work that I've started doing uh, in collaboration with Dan, George, Shimon Veld, Gavin Brennan, and also making contact with some work that Nick Minacucci and Akin Kampf at uh, RMIT and University of Waterloo uh, have been doing. And this is about uh, trying to understand some emergent geometries that we've seen up here uh, through symmetry breaking and in particular concepts that we can borrow uh, directly from ADS-CFT. So I'll begin by talking about some general notions and uh, put into context uh, the, the work that we're trying to do here. Um, it'll be a little bit backwards. First, I'll talk about holography and ADS-CFT as I understand it, and then that will lead into the motivations for why we're using these tools uh, to answer the questions we're trying to get at. But one thing that I, that I definitely want to do, um, first of all, this is work that is still in progress. Um, so, so it's rather exploratory at this stage, but I do want to try to at least uh, demystify some of the specific technical details of ADS-CFT, which are often uh, talked about in a, in a very general manner, but then perhaps left, you know, uh, unspecified otherwise. Um, and, then, and then once I do that, I'll we'll, we'll get into the specifics of this uh, symmetry breaking idea and what it is that we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so, so the first thing to say is some basic ideas about holography and what it really is. So, so very generally, as you'll know, what you're doing is representing um, a system or a theory in terms of a different system or a dual theory in a lower space-time dimension. Okay, but this is, this is somehow a, a very non-trivial statement, and it's something very much not just uh, a relabeling of degrees of freedom. You know, so so if, I, if I take an image like this and I add to it a depth map, which I can encode in, in pixels in 2D space, just like the original image um, with its color and hue values, I can reproduce some higher dimensional geometry by putting the two together and there are ostensibly degrees of freedom that are two dimensional. But this is, this is not what we mean when we talk about holography because this is something, this is, like I said, just a trivial relabeling of some uh, degrees of freedom. What we really mean is a duality between uh, a theory with gravity and a theory without gravity. And these types of theories are very different notionally. Um, quantum field theories, these are our local CFTs, um, but we don't have local gauge invariant observables in, in gravity or in quantum gravity. And finding a duality or a map between these two characteristically very different types of theories, uh, each w that independently have a high amount of constraints in their construction, this, this is a very non-trivial statement. So, so it's not just this kind of uh, relabeling of some degrees of freedom in terms of a, a dimension or something. Um, now, you'll, you'll have heard of, perhaps, uh, all kinds of different incarnations of this idea of holography. So one is the fluid gravity correspondence. This is some kind of correspondence between uh, Einstein's theory of gravity in some d-dimensional anti-de Sitter space. In some particular long wavelength limit, you can recover the equations of relativistic hydrodynamics on the boundary of that space-time. And the two theories are shown to be dual to each other. You can study phenomena from the gravitational side or from this hydrodynamic perspective. Uh, there are ideas that don't rely at all on asymptotically anti-de Sitter spaces, which are at the core of a lot of these ideas. The program of celestial holography, for example, uh, that's an attempt to formulate these ideas concretely in asymptotically flat space where you're basically studying asymptotic symmetry group of gauge theories on uh, the celestial sphere. So, so a, a two sphere um, at infinity, but an asymptotically flat space. And there are other ideas as well. The ideas are related to these uh, corner symmetries and, and corner charges um, championed by Laurent and William Donnelly. 
and others and, and, and all kinds of ideas that would fall under this umbrella term of holography. But, you know, you might wonder what's the fundamental reason that it seems not easy, but there seem to be so many different ways where you can understand a gravitational theory or degrees of freedom on some lower dimensional boundary. So it, it appears that the universe has way more degrees of or way less degrees of freedom rather than its volume would imply than just by a simple counting of QFT degrees of freedom on a manifold. Um, and one way to think about it, in the way that I like to think about it, to think about whether or not this is surprising that you can do this, is to um, remember what is the characteristic of a gauge theory that is different from a normal theory. So you'll remember that you know if you have an action for some theory, you'll vary this action, um, and the vanishing of the variation will give you the bulk equations of motion, the Euler-Lagrange equations, and there'll be this boundary term that you'll judiciously ignore uh, based on the premise that your physical matter fields, this is some integral over some field components over the volume of your space-time. So you can imagine a cylinder where you take the caps and the radius to infinity, and what you'll do is claim that the matter fields fall off sufficiently fast that you can ignore this boundary term. And so it doesn't affect the equations of motion and the bulk. Okay, so that's all well and good. Um, and then you will go on to construct some conserved quantities associated with the uh, symmetry variations of the action. So, you know, in the top line, I can define a symmetry variation to be something that leaves my action invariant up to a boundary term. This is, uh, this is just an arbitrary variation of the field degrees of freedom. But then I can perform a, a symmetry variation of the same action and find that it is, uh, its variation is given by this term here. So subtracting these two very different variations, I find some conserved quantity, which uh, I can integrate over some Cauchy slice to get a conserved charge. Okay, so that's all, that's all standard, but what happens with this charge? Well, the role of this charge is to actually generate the symmetries of the theory through its action, through the Poisson brackets, on the physical data of your theory. So these conserved quantities will act on the physical data and change the state. Okay, but what about a gauge theory? Well, in a gauge theory, this is distinguished from a non-gauge theory by the presence of constraints in the Hamiltonian. And these constraints need to be preserved throughout the evolution of the system. And what ends up happening is that in a gauge theory, this Noether current is a pure boundary term on shell. And so ordinarily, you can have a situation where these charges actually do vanish, and they will for pure gauge symmetries. These are ones that actually have to do with redundant degrees of freedom um, in your theory. Those charges will vanish, meaning that their action on the physical data of the theory will be nothing. They won't change the physical state. And those, those are proper gauge symmetries. Um, but in the presence of a boundary, certainly if there is no boundary in your space-time, then these will always vanish. But in the presence of a boundary, you have degrees of freedom, which were pure gauge, that can now become physical degrees of freedom when this boundary term does not vanish, okay? So that's the lesson. In gauge theories, you have this general feature that degrees of freedom, which are physical in the bulk, um, which are pure gauge in the bulk, can become physical in the presence of a boundary. And this kind of notion underlies many of those ideas where you study uh, asymptotic symmetries on some boundary that you insert into your space-time, and then you get some non-trivial degrees of freedom arising there from what were gauge symmetries in the bulk. So this, this kind of idea maybe gives you a hint that this holography is not so mysterious, um, and of course, it wouldn't be a talk about holography without mentioning ADS-CFT, and in fact, this is the setting in which the work that we're doing um, is going to be done. So this is probably the most well-known example of a concrete implementation of these holographic ideas. And essentially what you have there, conjecturally, is an equivalence between this type 2b string theory in the low energy limit with supergravity, uh, on ADS-5, five-dimensional anti-desitter space with some compactification, and uh, a gauge theory 
with no gravity, which is super Yang Mills theory in four dimensions uh, with four supersymmetry charges. Um, so everyone here will know, but it's worth just reminding us um, for a CFT, uh, this is, this is a, a field theory with some conformal symmetry. So you have translation, rotation, rescaling, and special conformal transformations. And CFTs have some unique properties, right? So they have a vanishing one-point function. The form of the two-point function is completely fixed by conformal symmetry. And then the three-point function uh, is fixed up to some uh, coefficients, which form the operator product expansion. And from there, you can determine the rest of the correlation function. So, so CFTs are, are a special type of field theory, which are highly constrained. They're scale invariant. And they arise generically near quantum critical points uh, as a UV fixed point um, of an ordinary quantum field theory and find broad application in, in all kinds of different places. Uh, since it'll come up later, it's just worth remembering, you know, if you, if you have a rescaling of some coordinate degree of freedom X, then, then your scalar field will just rescale like uh, lambda to the delta, where delta is this scaling dimension of, of that operator. And there are some bounds on the scaling dimensions of the operators that appear in generic CFTs. There's a unitarity bound, which tells you that this scaling dimension has to be greater than d minus 2 over 2 for the theory to be unitary. Um, okay, so that's fine for CFTs. Um, what about this mysterious uh, type 2b supergravity? Uh, well, this is, um, this is, like I said, the low energy limit of a string theory. So in the bulk of ADS, I have open strings, I have closed strings. They can interact, they can join together and split apart. And there is uh, string coupling, which controls the quantum corrections or string loop diagrams, and it's given by the expectation value of this scalar field, which appears in the theory. That's the dilaton. This is dimensionless coupling. There's also a uh, string length or string, string tension, it's alpha prime. L is the string length, which is like the energy scale of the theory. And so there are different limits you can consider by expanding uh, these parameters when they're small. And these will become important in a moment. So, so this is a complicated theory, um, but in most actual applications of ADS-CFT, and indeed in this, uh, uh, conjectured equality right here, we're taking, which you'll have heard, this large n limit um, and the low energy effective action for type 2b string theory, which is supergravity. Um, so what happens in these limits is you, is you do two things. The first thing you want to do is take, um, on the left hand side I have like gravity couplings and on the right hand side they're equivalent gauge theory couplings um, and you can you can show that these relationships are true although it's, it's non-trivial to do so um, but there's an important limit that we're going to use which is a semi-classical limit and here the first thing you do is you take uh, the string coupling to be small so taking the string coupling to be small means that you're suppressing loop diagrams it's, it's basically like a classical limit Okay, so you're suppressing quantum corrections, which arise from the fact that these loops can, uh, they can, they can stretch and form and join and, and make all these kinds of donut shapes. And so in, in taking this limit where GS is small, you're removing all these higher genus uh, world sheet diagrams um, from the theory. This correspondingly is the same as taking the rank of the gauge group, SUN, to be very large for the gauge theory. But this leaves you with classical string theory. It's, it, it's still extended objects, so classical strings. So the other thing that's done very commonly is to take this Tuft coupling, which is fixed in the first limit. You take this Tuft coupling uh, also to be large, okay? So by doing that, this Tuft coupling is a combination of N, which is already large, and the Yang-Mills coupling, or the gauge theory coupling, by taking this to be large, you ensure that the string length scale is very small compared to the length scale of the space-time in the bulk. Were it not, that would mean the curvatures would be very large, um, and 
by zooming out in this way, so th this is corresponding to taking the string length to be very small, what you're basically doing is treating strings as point particles, okay? So by starting from this type 2b supergravity theory, which is some very complicated theory um, with all kinds of different fields, uh, what you're able to do is move to a semi-classical limit where you basically have, there's no more strings, there's no more quantum effects in the bulk, you just have classical particles uh, on a fixed background. And this is a very useful limit um, to take because it, it dramatically simplifies the theory in the bulk. And that's what's done in, in many implementations of ADS-CFT and it's what's going to be done here because very little is known in moving away from this low energy limit where this string coupling uh, and the energy scale is very low compared to the string scale. So uh, having established that, the statement then of ADS-CFT is that I have this uh, low energy limit of type 2b supergravity on an anti de Sitter space, and I have a boundary on that anti de Sitter space where I have a conformal field theory, and the partition function of the bulk theory, which is just this path integral over the, the field degrees of freedom, including the metric, uh, is conjectured to be equivalent then to the partition function for the CFT, where I have these operator insertions, which are sourced by boundary values of the bulk fields. Okay, so the bulk contains fields, it has the metric, it has some scalar fields, it can have gauge fields, and those will have some boundary value behavior, and those boundary values of those bulk fields act as sources for operators in the boundary theory. This is what's known as this uh, GKPW uh, differentiate dictionary, okay? And it's called the differentiate dictionary because you take, once you have this partition function, you take functional derivatives with respect to the sources, these are like the J's, um, and you can compute correlation functions in the boundary theory. Um, now, this is uh, a nice way to study uh, dual systems, but the fact is that th this partition function is, is, is very hard to compute. And often even if you have ADS-CFT and you have this duality, it's often no easier to, to compute the partition function on the left compared to the one on the right. So, so in that sense, this duality isn't doing much for you. There is an equivalent formulation of this statement, which involves uh, taking the bulk fields, you know what they are, and uh, literally taking the limit of the bulk fields as they approach the boundary of your anti de Sitter space and then defining uh, the correlation functions in the boundary theory this way. And this is the perspective that, that we're gonna take in what's to follow, and this is called this extrapolate dictionary, and it's known to be equivalent to the other statement that the two partition functions of the bulk and the boundary are, are equal. Um, but so, so I said that it's, sometimes it's not useful in a calculational sense because computing the partition function on either side is equally difficult. But what makes uh, ADS-CFT useful is the fact that it's a weak, strong coupling duality. So I had this Tuft coupling and I took this to be large. Uh, and I took this to be large in order to suppress the stringiness of the strings in the bulk so that I could treat them as point particles. Um, what this means is that the gauge theory is at strong coupling. But conversely, this corresponded to taking the string length scale to be very small, and so curvatures are very small, so the gravity theory in the bulk is weakly coupled. And it's this weak, strong coupling duality, which is really uh, the powerful thing, because then you can study strongly coupled CFTs and systems described by strongly coupled CFTs and the like uh, by just studying weakly coupled uh, semi-classical gravity with some fields on top of it, on some fixed background. Um, now, conjecturally, you know, all the interesting CFTs have an ADS dual, um, but of course it's, it's not known in general. There are some properties that, that you know that need to be satisfied in order for a given conformal field theory to be describable in terms of a gravity dual. It has to have large central charge, so lots of degrees of freedom, small number of operators of low conformal dimension and so on, but there's absolutely no general proof that every interesting CFT can be built in this way from some bulk gravity theory. And 
you'll always hear, uh, as I have done here, this uh, N equals 4 super Yang Mills and type 2B supergravity cited just because that is one of the examples that's been the best studied and, and where we have an explicit uh, realization of the duality. But there are others, and I will mention, I will mention some others. Um, one other thing that is worth saying is that you don't necessarily need to um, believe in string theory in order to believe that holography or ADS CFT is useful. I described at least one example where there is no string theory involved, which is the fluid gravity correspondence. Um, but more generally, you can consider uh, this kind of bottom-up perspective where you're agnostic about what the theory is in the bulk. You know you have a CFT on the boundary, and the bulk is described by some effective semi-classical theory with some arbitrary fields. And as I mentioned, these fields take on boundary values um, at the, the boundary of ADS, and they will source, uh, they will act as, as currents which, which source operators in that boundary theory. Now, one should not think that there is just like a theory on the boundary of anti de Sitter space, and there is some stuff in the bulk. One should think that you have surfaces, a Z here is a radial coordinate in ADS, so Z equals zero corresponds to infinity or the boundary of ADS. And one should think that you don't just have a CFT or a, or a theory on the boundary, but you have a, a theory defined at every radial slice in anti de Sitter space, a different theory, which is um, just the effective theory you obtain by imposing a cutoff at an energy scale, which is the inverse of the anti de Sitter radius. So, so the radius, what does that extra dimension do for you in ADS CFT? That extra dimension is like an energy scale in the CFT. So taking Z to zero corresponds to taking the energy to infinity, which is the UV limit of your theory. But you can look at the same theory. It doesn't have to be at the boundary. You can look at the theory at any slice in ADS. And what you will have is the effective theory obtained by imposing the cutoff roughly at the inverse of wherever that radius is. And the bulk fields, their value at that surface control which currents you turn on in the theory uh, and their correlation functions and, and so on. Um, so so that's, a, that's a picture to have in your mind that it's not just there's a boundary and our, oh, our universe isn't ADS, so why do I care about this and so on. Um, now, there are a number of motivations that we have for, for using these kinds of holographic ideas. They're very useful even if you don't believe fundamentally uh, that the universe behaves this way. Um, I said you can learn things about strongly coupled gauge theories, and that's true. Uh, here's a famous example where this ratio of the entropy density, uh, the, the shear viscosity to the entropy, um, they derived a universal lower bound for this ratio, which can only be computed at strong coupling in a gauge theory. And this was computed by studying weakly coupled gravity using ADS CFT and applies to universally to, to quantum theories. And that's an example where you learn something fundamental by studying a system holographically. You'll probably, most of you be familiar with Ryu Takayanagi. Um, this is an example where you find something that you can reinterpret in a different way that is much easier to calculate often which is the entanglement entropy. Um, holographically given by the extremal surface in the bulk, and you can compute the area of this extremal surface uh, that limits to, to your entanglement boundary in the boundary theory, and, and oftentimes computing the area of that surface is much easier than actually computing the entanglement entropy. And there are some other examples uh, from this bottom-up approach where holography just gives you kind of a different perspective on something that you could already compute in principle. Um, in this paper here, they compute the optical conductivity and study holographic superconductors um, from the perspective of ADS CFT, from this bottom up point of view, this effective field theory point of view. So, lots of different things you can study. What we're particularly interested in, or, or one of our main motivations, are a number of ideas which have emerged over the years, where some kind of geometry emerges from something more fundamental. Okay, there are all kinds of ideas like this. There's uh, Sakharov's induced gravity. So in induced gravity, you have 
um, some matter fields over some uh, unspecified background. There's no equation of motion for the gravity. You just have scalar fields, bosonic fields. And then you compute the action to one loop, and the one loop renormalized effective action automatically induces the Einstein-Hilbert term in the action. And so Einstein gravity just appears through renormalization in this induced gravity idea from uh, matter degrees of freedom. You also have ideas like entropic gravity, Berlin's entropic gravity, where uh, you can think of the gravitational force as like the entropy. So if you have like a polymer, you know, a polymer will have a, an apparent force pulling it. It doesn't like to be in a straight line because it's entropically favorable for it to be, to be wiggly when it's put in a heat bath. And so it will induce a force on, on an object if you pull on the end. And in the same way, uh, in this kind of work, they derive Newton's laws um, from notions of entropy, which rely fundamentally on the idea that the maximal amount of entropy that you can have in a region of space-time is given by the area of the surface bounding that volume. So this is, this is a holographic idea. Um, we are mostly interested in these kinds of ideas. Akim's, uh, I call it spectral gravity. I don't know uh, what you would want to call it, where basically the fundamental role of space-time itself is uh, replaced by information theory degrees of freedom. Okay, so um, this, this idea that you can not just reconstruct the metric from quantum information quantities, but that the metric is not, the, the idea of position in space um, is not at all fundamental and it's really just information that's fundamental and geometry in certain regimes arises from that. And in, under that umbrella, there is this kind of um, uh, one way to proceed, which is to, to recover the metric given a correlation function. So you can do this, you can reconstruct the metric by taking the coincidence limit of a correlation function after taking some derivatives and get the metric because the, this quantity on the right uh, depends on the Sinji world function, which is just like the metric. And um, Dan Gavin and Shimon uh, have been working on this uh, for some time now from the wavelet perspective. And basically this wavelet idea, it's like a Fourier transform, but instead of decomposing your field into frequency components, different frequency components, you're decomposing it into different uh, scale components. So you can do this wavelet transformation, which depends on some scale parameter A on a field, but then likewise, you can also decompose a correlation function using this wavelet transformation. And in the same way, you can attempt to reconstruct a metric um, from these wavelet transformed correlation functions instead of just your ordinary QFT correlation functions. Now, there's something that they did there, and I won't claim to uh, understand all the details fully. Those of you who went to RQI will have seen uh, Dan talk uh, in more detail about this. Um, but essentially what happens is that if you take a free bosonic field in one plus one dimension, you um, do this wavelet transformation on the correlation functions, and then you recon reconstruct the metric interpreting the scale variable for the wavelet transform as uh, a space-time dimension, that's this A, then what you find is that the metric you recover is exactly the metric of anti de Sitter space here in Euclidean signature. And this ADS length scale um, is related to the scale cutoff in your wavelet transform. So this already sounds a lot like, uh, hopefully what I described earlier, which is what happens in ADS CFT, that this, um, that this radial direction, which was labeled Z before, but is now A, acts as, um, acts as the scale in your field theory, the scale degree of freedom. You can do the same thing for fermionic fields, again in one plus one dimension, and recover also uh, a metric which is exactly anti de Sitter space in point gray coordinates, here it's a little bit different because the anti de Sitter length scale um, now depends on the wavelet index and not just uh, the scale cutoff. So this is kind of the observation that we made and something that we're really trying to understand is uh, how can we assign meaning to these emergent metrics? Um, what is really going on? And 
To me, immediately, when you see an anti desitter space, ADS CFT springs to mind. And part of our motivation isn't then to use the tools of ADS CFT to understand these emergent ADS metrics that you compute by computing correlation functions uh, from this wavelet perspective. Now, we could seek guidance from some known dualities. Um, there are a few, but most of them are conjecture. Um, so we have supergravity on ADS5, compactified on S5, which was super Yang Mills theory in the large n limit. But there are other examples. Pure gravity, so just Einstein Hilbert gravity with negative cosmological constant, is conjecturally equivalent to this FLM monster theory. Um, Chern Simons on ADS3 is known to be dual to this West Sumino Witten CFT. For our purposes, it seems to be relevant, but we don't really understand how it fits into this picture. Free field theory is known to be, or conjectured, to be dual to um, this family of higher spin gravity theories. So theories which include uh, degrees of freedom of arbitrarily high spin, not just, not just spin one-half massless degrees of freedom. Um, we're working with free field theories here, but uh, the relationship here is not is in no way proven and it's just a very general, um, it's a very general statement which doesn't do much to help us disentangle what's going on with the reconstruction of these ADS metrics. So let me, uh, because I've said uh, asymptotically ADS a few times, let me just, you'll all know this, but concretely say what it is. So we have anti desitter space, which is this maximally symmetric vacuum solution with negative cosmological constant. Um, and basically the symmetry group of ADS is uh, the orthogonal group in two and D minus one dimensions. So big, big D is always gonna be the bulk dimension and I'll, I'll reserve little D for the one lower for the boundary dimension. And um, so, so much of the machinery of ADS-CFT relies on the fact that this, this isn't Lorentzian signature, this is also the, the group of conformal transformations on, on a d-dimensional uh, boundary. So you can write the, the ADS metric in, in Poincaré form. So here it is in Lorentzian signature, where z is uh, the radial variable and z goes to zero at the boundary of ADS. Now, an important piece of technology is the existence of this pfefferman gram form of the metric. So any metric which is asymptotically anti desitter near the z equals zero boundary can always be brought into this pfefferman gram form. Here, rho is basically like z squared. And this g is a metric that depends on, you know, all, all of the coordinates except for, um, yeah, there shouldn't be a row there. All the coordinates except for rho. And any asymptotically ADS metric can always be brought into this form. Um, so one question you might think to ask is, if I give you a boundary metric, does it, does it induce, or, or given, a, given an anti desitter metric, does it induce a unique metric of the boundary? And the answer is no. Um, it induces a unique metric, a conformal equivalence class of metrics, so a metric uh, up to conformal transformation, uniquely. But you still have this freedom of a conformal transformation of the boundary metric, so that's something that, in principle, you need to fix uh, when you're studying this bulk to boundary map, which is what we're going to do here. Um, so so that, that is done through this defining function, z squared. You know, ADS is not compact. So what I have to do is, is compactify it and then add a boundary, and I'm really working with, with um, this metric which, where I've mapped the interior of ADS, or I've mapped all of ADS to the interior of this new metric and then closed it, and the metric there, G0, is this uh, rescaled metric by this function Z squared. Because a ADS itself is a double pole at infinity, so I need to multiply it by some defining function which has just a single zero at, at Z equals zero, with a non-vanishing derivative at the boundary, and then I get a proper metric with a, with a boundary metric, an induced boundary metric. Again, up to conformal transformations. Okay. 
So that, that'll, be, that'll be useful in what's to come. So now the question is, so keeping in mind what we had before, which is uh, free field theory, so one plus one dimensional fermionic and bosonic theories, and somehow we arrive at a two plus one dimensional anti to sitter space. So one thing you can think to do is to just ask the question, well, suppose I have a free bosonic theory on a Euclidean one plus one dimensional Euclidean space. Um, if I were to do, if I could reconstruct the bulk metric uh, as you would in ADS CFT, would I get the same metric that you get when you do this uh, metric reconstruction using uh, wavelets? And so th there is a procedure for doing that. Um, and it involves putting first the metric in this Pfefferman Graham form. So if this G is like uh, the identity, if it's delta, then this is exactly ADS. But again, any asymptotically ADS metric you, you can bring into this form near the boundary. And this, this idea is to expand the bulk fields, in this case, the metric, expand it in powers of Z or rho. So this is an expansion of the field, the bulk field near the boundary. Um, this is uh, described in, in good detail in these papers here and falls under the umbrella term of holographic renormalization. Now, Again, you can ask the question, how much of the bulk is determined by specifying the boundary metric, which we have done. It's, uh, it's just Euclidean space, flat. Um, and the answer is mm, not everything. So in any dimension, only the trace of G and its covariant divergence are determined by fixing the metric on the boundary. And if you want to know more, if you want to probe deeper into the interior, you need extra data um, from the CFT. You need to specify more things about the boundary theory. Of course, it turns out, um, well, I'll say what turns out once I tell you how to actually do it. The way you do it is to write down the Einstein equations in the bulk and write down this expansion of the field, uh, this, the, the metric near the boundary, insert it into Einstein's equations, and then solve Einstein's equations order by order in rho, which is your expansion variable near the boundary. That's your z squared. Okay, so you can do this and slowly reconstruct order by order the entire metric in the bulk. Um, what you find is if that the boundary dimension is odd, then the expectation value, or I should say the bulk metric to order G uh, D in that expansion is determined by the expectation value of the stress energy tensor of the boundary theory. And this really is uh, the proper, like the Brown York uh, quasi local stress tensor defined at the boundary of ADS. So this is the CFT stress tensor and the expectation value of the CFT stress tensor will allow you to determine the bulk metric up to order G D but not the, whole, not the whole thing. You already know what the metric is to leading order because you've specified the boundary metric. So that's your G zero. The expectation value of the stress tensor gives you the next term. And then if you want to compute more, you need to specify more things about the CFT. In even dimensions, you can do the same procedure if the boundary is even dimension um, and find that you have non-vanishing trace so this is the trace anomaly that vanishes in odd dimensions. Um, but in even boundary dimensions, this trace anomaly, it, you, I mean, you get the right answer, is proportional to the central charge, um, where the central charge is just three over two uh, times the ADS length scale. Uh, this is what the central charge is supposed to be for a two-dimensional CFT. Um, and indeed, you recover that here. And you can, again, compute the the boundary, or, or given the boundary stress tensor, rather, you can compute um, the metric up to order GD, or conversely, if you already knew the bulk metric, you would need to have the first two terms in the expansion near the boundary to compute the expectation value of the dual stress tensor. Um, so, so that's the lesson. So given, given a, a boundary metric that you've specified or conformal structure at infinity, you can determine an asymptotic expansion of the metric up to order uh, G2.
basically your GD. And beyond that, you need uh, to specify more CFT data to probe any deeper in the vault. Now the metrics that we started with, well, let me remind you, these are actually, they're, they're not asymptotically ADS, they are ADS, they're just pure ADS. So you can do this whole bulk reconstruction thing starting from a bosonic or a fermionic field in one plus one dimension. And you can verify that the, the metric that you get is, is ADS as it should be. But there's something here that, that doesn't work out, which is the fact that um, the central charge, the ratio of the central charge of the bosonic theory and the fermionic theory should be, should be two, right? But um, the central charge was given by the ADS length scale. Okay, so if the central charge is given by the ADS length scale, um, then these cannot work out to the right ratio. Because for the bosonic theory, we have the ADS length scale just being A, but for the fermionic theory, it's um, some function of this wavelet order. And so something isn't working out here um, when we just try to naively look at what we expect from this bulk to boundary map. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, you can't, uh, you can't learn everything just by fixing the boundary metric and just having a propagator, just a free field theory. Um, you can if the bulk while tensor vanishes. So, so when D is two or three, you can determine everything, um, but otherwise you can't, and you need more data such as input from the one point function. This F is an expansion, a generic expansion that you can use to expand all of the fields in the bulk, the metric, but any scalar or gauge fields that you also have. Um, near the boundary and do the same kind of analysis using the bulk equations of motion that you that you did before. So in order to try to get a bit more intuition for what's happening, um, what we're going to do is try to turn on some fields, right? So, so we have this anti de Sitter space. This is the ground state of the theory. We don't know what the theory is. So ADS is a state in the theory and it corresponds to the vacuum state of the of the CFT. But um, we don't know if the bulk theory is supposed to be GR or if there's supposed to be other fields or something going on here. So the way that you learn more is by going back to this partition function by turning on these source currents for these dual operators. Okay, um, so operator insertions in the boundary theory require the excitation of bulk fields other than the metric. Um, the metric is just dual to the stress tensor in the boundary. But if you want to have some kind of operator insertion like this, you need to have a non-vanishing bulk field that uh, gives you the, the source for this, this operator in the boundary theory. So um, what we're gonna require at minimum in, in the bulk to get a handle on this is a scalar field. So we have Einstein gravity in four dimensions and we have a scalar field and I've put in the cosmological constant here in this potential, and that's some mass, and, and you can generalize to include some interactions. When this vanishes, the, the scalar field vanishes, then you just have Einstein-Hilbert in the bulk, and the solution is ADS, and that's the ground state of the, the, the boundary theory, and, and that's that. Um, but now what we can do is we can turn on the bulk fields and study what happens to try to disentangle um, this uh, emergent ADS metric. Um, you can also uh, do things like add a, a gauge field here, so an F mu nu, F mu nu, if, if you wanted to study a charge CFT. And it says holographic lattice here. I haven't given away what it is that, that, that we're going to do, um, so, so I won't. I'll just move on and, and mention that uh, what you need to do is then solve the coupled Einstein scalar field equations. Okay. So... Now, here's what we're going to do. If you, so we, we have this boundary theory. We don't know how to understand the emergence of the anti de Sitter metric just in terms of the free bosonic theory. So now we're going to deform the boundary theory. This will require turning on some scalar fields in the bulk, and we're going to try to construct the map this way and see if we can find how this bulk reconstruction or this bulk to boundary map agrees with the same thing that we do when we reconstruct the bulk metric using the wavelets. So 
the first thing you need to do is an analysis at the linear level. So if you start with the anti-de-sitter space and you turn on some fields, if the fields don't back react on the geometry, then you can just study the propagation of fields on a fixed background. And so the fixed background here is just going to be anti-de-sitter space in four dimensions, and you can include uh, a metric function f here if you wanted to have a horizon, for example, but you just set that to one um, just to get pure ADS. We're also going to fix the boundary metric, so the metric will just be flat, and this is in Euclidean signature, and that's where the bosonic theory lives. Now, as I mentioned, you can expand not just the metric, but all of the bulk fields near the boundary. So this is an expansion of the scalar field phi. Z is the radial coordinate. The boundary theory is, is two plus one dimensions, so these are the two spatial dimensions. I assume everything is time dependent, or time independent rather. And you have an expansion of the scalar field in the bulk uh, in terms of Z near the boundary, so phi one and phi two. What you can do is then take uh, the Klein-Gordon equation in the bulk, and you can, um, you can write it in terms of this differential equation, um, in terms of variable z, and just solve for its behavior of the scalar field near the boundary. So this is the solution of the, the Klein-Gordon equation in the bulk near the boundary, um, and it has two solutions, c1 and c2, where they scale like some power of z. Now, the, the power of z here is the scaling dimension of the operator in the boundary. So we have these two solutions, and the bulk field behaves near the boundary like z to the delta, where delta is the scaling dimension of the operator that this, uh, that this acts as a source current for. And what it means is that um, we must have that, so if this is z to the delta, you can, you can solve for delta, you can solve for m squared, and, and basically this is the relationship you would read off. m squared, m is the mass of the bulk field, m squared is delta, delta minus 3, and delta therefore takes on these values. So what you learn from this is that when you have a scalar field, a non-trivial scalar field in the bulk, it will source operator insertions of dimension delta in the boundary, where delta is given by the mass of the bulk field. So we would like, we have a unitarity bound, and so for the 2 plus 1 dimensional CFT, we need um, that delta is greater than or equal to 1 half, okay? Otherwise, it's not unitary. So what happens if you pick delta is 1? So an operator of scaling dimension 1 would be sourced by a Klein-Gordon field um, with mass is equal to minus 2. Likewise, an operator of scaling dimension 2 in the boundary theory would be sourced by Klein-Gordon field with mass uh, negative 2. So this is good. Um, you might protest that we cannot take m squared to be minus 2, because it's a tachyon, negative mass squared. Um, but as long as you satisfy this breeden lochner friedman bound, um, then, then the excitations are still stable. So in anti de Sitter space, because of the, the potential, um, you can actually have negative mass squared excitations of a scalar field still being stable and everything unitary, as long as the mass of that bulk field is greater than or equal to, well, in, in general dimensions, it's minus d squared over 4. Okay, so generically, you take m squared to minus 2, and this allows you to study... Um, operator insertions of the boundary of dimension 1 or 2. And that's, that tells you something, but now we need to actually... Um, okay, what do these bulk fields do? Well, to understand how they enter into the boundary theory, so you remember you have this expansion near the boundary in terms of z. What you want to do, what we want to do, is introduce a defect. We want to deform the boundary theory this bosonic boundary theory. So whatever the action is for the CFT, you don't have to specify it. We can study a, a defect CFT, uh, an equivalent CFT, which is the original CFT plus the insertion of this defect operator. And I've labeled it phi1 because that's exactly the role of phi1. The leading term in the expansion of the bulk field at the boundary acts as the source 
for the dual operator. This is a general statement. Um, these fields are zero at the boundary. Okay, there's no constant term. So it, it, all the bulk fields vanish on the boundary, but it's their leading behavior that gives you the sources for the, the operators in the dual theory. And specifically, what I want to study is an operator insertion like this that source that sources a delta function in two dimensions in the boundary theory. Um, so what this looks like is a, is a defect in, in the boundary theory. Um, so I have, a, I have the boundary, suppose it was, it was just one plus one dimensional. So here the red line is, is the boundary CFT and uh, its evolution is given by the, the dashed line in the time direction. This is what's called a line defect. And what the line defect does is it breaks the conformal symmetry. So the connected subgroup for, for you know, ADSD was, was SO1 D plus one and Euclidean signature. But for a dimension P defect like this, um, I don't retain the full conformal symmetry because now, you know, translations in the direction transverse to the defect, the thing, things do not transform. Um, so the remaining subgroup that you preserve are conformal transformations along the defect and rotations in the direction transverse to the defect. Um, but in D equals two, uh, the situation is a bit degenerate because what you'll see is that I have this one plus one dimensional CFT on this red line. And by inserting something here in the middle, this defect, what I'm effectively doing is separating the, the, the CFT space into two distinct parts. Okay. And that is an interesting thing to study, but that is like I've inserted an interface in the boundary CFT. Um, and there's kind of a degeneracy between a line defect and an interface when, when the boundary theory is just two dimensional. So instead, uh, what I'm going to study is a boundary theory, which is two plus one dimensional, but still uh, a point like defect in this boundary theory. So you can imagine this point like defect as like an impurity in like a two dimensional crystal or some two dimensional system. You have a, you can have a spin defect, a magnetic defect or something, um, impurity that you embed there could be a mass defect. And now we want to study what happens to the bulk upon insertion of this kind of defect in the boundary theory. Um, and this is also a line defect because it will just trace out a line in time. But again, I assume that everything is constant in time. Immediately, because you break the conformal symmetry, there are consequences for the one-point function. For example, normally in a CFT, it vanishes. It no longer does. Um, but we're really interested in applying this idea of uh, these boundary insertions to, to, to really understand um, what is going on with the bulk theory. But you can also apply it to physical systems, and this has been done in, in a variety of works. They'll be called holographic Q lattices. So the study of charged lattices by the insertion of defects in the CFT. Now, most of the studies that have been done and these defect CFTs, um, they don't consider uh, defects which are localized in two spatial dimensions. Usually, it's just a defect localized in one spatial dimension or an interface like this. And the reason is because, uh, you know, I could study a defect which is a line, which will preserve more of the symmetry. Um, but here I've broken the maximal number of translational symmetry in the boundary theory. So what it means is that when I go to try to reconstruct the bulk metric, um, I have a lot more uh, freedom in what that metric is. It, it, it's a lot uh, less constrained, or a lot harder to solve for because I have much less symmetry. Um, now, what we want to do specifically is study uh, delta function is difficult. So we use a Gaussian profile for the scalar field to act as the source for this boundary operator, this boundary defect. Um, so this is just a Gaussian, and later you can take the width to zero to get a to get a delta function like a defect. And again, in the linearized analysis, you just want to solve the Klein-Gordon equation on an ADS background. You do this here, and you can find a solution after you impose boundary conditions, which has the correct near boundary behavior. So the leading term is this Gaussian. That's the source for the dual operator. That's what we wanted, the, the defect operator. But you also have the subleading term. Now, the subleading term gives the expectation value of that dual operator, 
but this diverges. So what this is telling you is that um, turning on this scalar field, you can't, um, it, it's back reacting on the bulk metric. So we, we can't, we can study the near boundary behavior, the leading behavior, but um, after that, we need to actually consider the back reaction on the bulk metric um, to really understand what's going on. What does this scalar field look like? What does this defect look like? Well, you can plot it here. So this is the Z coordinate, the depth. So this is the anti desitter space. And you can imagine you have like, we turned on this bulk field, it's the scalar cloud. And this scalar cloud, as you approach the boundary of ADS, which is this plane here, it approaches a Gaussian or a delta function at X and Y is equal to zero. So this scalar cloud sources this impurity or this defect in this boundary theory. And the nice thing about these kinds of constructions is it's fairly straightforward, at least at the linear level, to generalize to solutions where you source multiple defects in the boundary. And so you can construct this holographic lattice um, by turning on this scalar field. Since we've done this, we said that the back reaction is no longer negligible. Um, so we need to solve the coupled Einstein scalar uh, equations. We don't have a vacuum anymore. Um, so this T mu nu is given by, by the scalar field. And we need to solve the coupled Einstein Klein Gordon equations for some potential V here. This is a very difficult uh, thing to do. So in previous uh, studies, They've either looked at um, defects in only one dimension or numerical solutions uh, to supergravity equations of motion. Here we're interested in the minimal amount of field content in the bulk that is required to, to implement this kind of Gaussian defect in the boundary theory. Um, so you take as an ansatz for the metric just a general metric which preserves the, the SO1 P plus one that you have and the SOQ around the defect. And you can insert some warp factors. So this is ADS2 cross S1 warped over a line. And um, these warp factors let you simplify the equations of motion when you solve them. It's easier to work with the trace reverse form of Einstein's equations here, eight pi G is one. And basically these, this is a system of equations that you need to solve. Um, in six dimensional uh, cases, so engaged supergravity in six dimensions, these kinds of equations, you have enough uh, field content and enough symmetry that these reduce to first order differential equations um, and, and you, can, you can readily solve for them. But here, here we don't have enough symmetry to do that. And um, th this is quite a struggle and this is where things start to get uh, uh, conjectural, let's say, or, or still uh, kind of work in progress in, in solving these equations for the bulk metric. So one thing you can think to do is to take a more restrictive ansatz for the bulk. Um, so this is just a, a generic um, asymptotically ADS metric in terms of a radial coordinate Y and imposing smoothness requirements at the center uh, lets you start to reconstruct the metric function um, like this. And then once you get the metric, you could evaluate in principle the on-shell action, which will give you the expectation value of the, the defect operator, the dual defect operator, and the expectation value of the boundary stress tensor. So that'd be very nice if, if we can get that. But this is, um, this is all still a work in progress. Um, the, the transformations of that pfefferman gram form will, will not be integrable, but you'll be able to do an expansion and then recover the, the boundary stress tensor in the presence of the defect. And you can go on to study things like perturbations um, of the field on this background, which will correspond to some excitations in the, in the boundary CFT, um, as has been done. Uh, in this work here of Horowitz, Santos, and Tong for a one-dimensional defect. Um, and I should say that the, the hope here is that what's going to happen is when you, when you put in the same Gaussian source into the, the one plus one dimensional bosonic theory, actually we'll have to do it in two plus one, when you insert the same kind of defect operator there, and do the wavelet reconstruction of the metric that you will get the same metric that you get um, 
from solving, from doing the bulk reconstruction from the perspective of ADS CFT. This is what the hope is. And, and we're, we're doing this because um, we couldn't really learn anything non-trivial from the fact that we just had a one plus one bosonic CFT and it gave you exactly ADS space and the bulk to boundary map there is, is fairly trivial. Um, but we had this problem where the central charges didn't match up. So something was clearly wrong. This is our way of doing the next most general thing in deforming both the boundary theory and the metric in the bulk to see if the results that we get from ADS CFT match the type of thing that we get when you do this kind of wavelet reconstruction of the metric. That's one of our motivations. The other motivation is simply that this uh, hasn't been done before for such a, um, such a symmetry breaking defect, let's say. Um, and, and we want to see if we can implement this bottom up approach and, and really what is the minimal field content required to construct those kinds of defects in the boundary theory and then what kind of systems can we study uh, with those? So we're really looking for more practical applications of this bottom-up approach to holography. Nonetheless, it should be said that, you know, top-down approaches where you start with quantum gravity or string theory in the bulk, um, if that's really the way the universe works, then, then you can really say something fundamental. But even if that's not the case, uh, the hope is that we can still at least uh, calculate things or, or look at systems, CFT systems or condensed matter systems in a, in a different perspective. Um, and certainly to try to understand uh, what's going on with the emergent metrics from the wavelet point of view. But I don't think that, that is something that we'll be able to understand without uh, better control over the renormalization group flow or better understanding of how that works um, from this point of view. Okay, so that was a lot of content and I'm a, a bit over time here and I know it's supposed to be like 45 minutes. So I do apologize for that. Uh, and I, a big thank you to Nico, uh, Jermaine and Evan for organizing this and for, for everyone who sat around until after six to listen to me talk. So thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. I, I realized we went a bit over time, because, uh, but I think we're all too interested to interrupt you. Uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, I would have welcomed introductions. I pro uh, interruptions. I probably would have had to skip a few things, but uh, that's, <laughs> I, I, I wanted the whole picture to be there and it's a, you know, it, it's a lot to, to keep track of mentally, you know? So thanks for your patience, everyone. Danny, you're on mute. I still feel ignorant, but now I'm more enlightened about my ignorance, and that's already something. So, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully at least it may be a jumping off point to... Um, I can share the references as well, because I, I, I know for me, like I said, I, I always heard a lot of these statements, but until you start working with it, then it all just sounds like magic, kind of, or, or just nonsense, one or the other. So... Um, so uh, it, one of the things you were talking about was um, if, you, if you don't go to the full boundary of the ADS, so if you just, um, I guess when Z is not zero, mm -hmm. uh, in that case, is the boundary you form uh, no longer conformal? Uh, let me go back to the image. Perhaps here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you're at the boundary, then then you you have a CFT. You have the full conformal symmetry. Um, but that is no longer true if you're if you're in the bulk. So generically, this will be some you know quantum effective action describing the system. Um, so you will have flown aw flowed away from this this UV fixed point at at which point you have a CFT. Yeah, but the, but the effective action on, on this surface away from Z equals zero will not necessarily have the same symmetries that you have uh, at the boundary, which is why, you know, the, that's a nice place to be, um, essentially. But, but you could study a theory um, elsewhere, and you could compute the partition function there as well, right? and the stress tensor and so on. I, I gave the, the formula... Um, 
the stress tensor of the theory defined here, where z is not zero, is just, is just this. It's the variation of the action in the bulk, where this metric now is not the boundary of ADS, but it's the induced metric on the boundary that you specified somewhere inside the ADS space. So you could do that and then compute the stress tensor and then study that theory as well. But you would not have all the symmetry. Cool. Uh, could you remind me again, uh, you said that when you put a, uh, a defect near the boundary, something diverges? What was it that diverged? The one point function was it? It doesn't diverge, but normally in a CFT, the one point function vanishes. Okay, I'm trying to find the slide here. So ordinarily in a CFT, this, the expectation value of this operator, um, any one point function vanishes. What you do, and, and you have the full, the boundary is just, to, you're in the vacuum and you have the full conformal symmetry. Now, when you put a defect, any kind of defect, you necessarily break the conformal symmetry, so you lose some of the nice properties that a CFT normally enjoys. And one of those things that you lose is the vanishing of the one-point function. So now it's some non-trivial uh, value, and this will depend on exactly what kind of defect you inserted there. But the main message was that in order to even put a defect, in, in order to move away from the vacuum, everyone knows uh, ADS, is like the vacuum state, you know, of the CFT, and you'll probably have heard, oh, if you have a if you have a black hole in ADS, that's dual to a, a CFT at some finite temperature. Okay, but right, but right. this is but this is trying to move. Okay, what if you actually move past those? Those are the most highly symmetric scenarios you can study. This is trying to um, to move away from those because it's the only way you can learn more about the theory in the bulk. You don't know what it is um, necessarily. Hi, Bill. Okay. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, this question about so when you look at this back reaction, the the parameter that controls how reliable the, the expressions are is is this uh, this H parameter that was the 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 uh, Source term, is that right? Yeah, so, so this, so if you wanted to just study um, Klein Gordon on just the, the pure ADS background with no back reaction, then you can still insert this defect, but yeah, H here needs to be small. Yeah. Yeah, so at the, at the linearized level, H is small. But this, but, but everything you've described here doesn't require uh, the, the sort of original assumption of ADS CFT where the uh, central charge is large so that the gravitational coupling is both is small, right? Like you don't have to make that assumption for what you're doing here. Is that correct? Um hmm. Yeah. Okay. So so basically when you're when you're studying these uh when you're, when you're doing this kind of bottom-up analysis um, where, where we're not assuming any like super gravity in the bulk or, or a particular version of string theory or something and then taking specific limits to arrive at the theory you want in the, in the boundary, you're doing the opposite. Um, when you do this, you're pretty much throwing away all of the uh, nice kind of uh, established results that you have and assumptions that go into the concrete uh, proof, let's say, of, of ADS CFT that comes from that example, Super Yang Mills and, and Type 2B. So, yeah, there's a lot of conditions there that you have on the gate, you know, your strong coupling, weak coupling, um, duality, and so on. You have conformal symmetry, you cannot break it. It is literally a CFT, it is literally uh, asymptotically ADS. And you kind of lose most of that when you do this bottom-up approach thing. And that, I, guess, I think that's one of the main criticisms of this kind of analysis is um, 
it feels a little dirty because you're not using most of those uh, what are viewed as very important constraints or lessons from the actual string theory example in doing this. Um, so we, we don't have those kinds of restrictions on H, but I mean, certainly if, if H is too large and if the curvature in the bulk correspondingly is too large, then, I mean, you can still do this bulk boundary analysis, but I, I don't know what right you would have to say that this is some example of, of ADS CFT. At least it wouldn't fit into the, the current uh, frameworks that are known. Um, from this point of view, and the last thing I'll say, this is a very long answer to a simple question. Um, from this point of view, this, this bottom-up thing that we're doing, it's, um, it, it's not saying something necessarily fundamental about the universe being holographic and gravity degrees of freedom actually being a lower dimensional CFT, but it's more useful to think of it as um, a way of organizing degrees of freedom that appear in the boundary in terms of uh, energy scale. And so, so we're just using the kind of the concepts from ADS CFT to, to do this organization for us, remaining agnostic about whether or not the full boundary uh, bulk theory is something that actually appears as a limit of string theory or, or is a real theory of the universe. But of course, it's just Einstein gravity with a scalar. So that, you know, that does appear in string theory in a particular limit. So, Right. Okay. Right, because I mean, I, I guess I mean the same thing happens with like Rio Taganaki. Like you don't need string theory for that. You can just go ahead and do it for. Yeah, you don't. You don't, right? So, so it's mostly. Um, I mean, you check after. You check after. So, so what we would do here is we would uh, do this bulk reconstruction, understand what the scalar field is and what it's doing and what this defect operator looks like, and then go back to the ADS CFT dictionary and check that it actually makes sense on both sides and that we're getting the right answers. For example, the conformal anomaly here should vanish because we're in odd dimensions. And so we can do this bulk reconstruction. We can use the tools of ADS CFT or the prescription to compute the boundary stress tensor, compute the expectation value, take the trace and it better vanish because that's what it's supposed to do even in the string theory example, right? So, so we can do checks. Um, okay, well, I, I won't, uh, I won't keep uh, you guys any longer. So, uh, if there's no other questions, then I'm happy to wrap up. But, yeah. Well, oh, Danny. thank you very much, Phil, for this. No, no, no. Really, I uh, nice hope talk. I'll be able to probe your brain more closely. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.